Chapter One in the Sweet Dry and Dry. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. In the Sweet Dry and Dry by Christopher Morley and Bart Haley. Chapter One Mystery of the Unexpected Julep. Dunraven Bleak, the managing editor of the Evening Balloon, sat at his desk in the center of the local room under a furious cone of electric light. It was six o'clock of a warm summer afternoon. He was filling his pipe and turning over the pages of the final edition of the paper, which had just come up from the press room. After the turmoil of the day, the room had quieted. Most of the reporters had left, and the shaded lamps shone upon empty tables and a floor strewn ankle-deep with papers. Nearby sat the city editor, checking over the list of assignments for the next morning. From an adjoining kennel issued occasional deep groans and a strong whiff of savage shag tobacco blown outward by the droning gust of an electric fan these proved that the cartoonist a man whose sprightly drawings were born to an obligato of vehement blasphemy was at work within mr bleak was just beginning to recuperate from the incessant vigilance of the day's work there was an unconscious pathos in his lean, desiccated figure as he rose and crossed the room to the green-glass drinking fountain. After the custom of experienced newspapermen, he rapidly twirled a makeshift cup out of a sheet of copy-paper. He poured himself a draught of clear but rather tepid water, and drank it without noticeable relish. His lifted head betrayed only the automatic thankfulness of the domestic fowl. There had been a time when six o'clock meant something better than a paper goblet of lukewarm filtration. He sat down at his desk again. He had loaded his pipe sedulously, with an extra fine blend which he kept in his desk drawer for smoking, during rare moments of relaxation when he had leisure to savor it. As he reached for a match he was meditating a genial remark to the city editor, when he discovered that there was only one tan sticker in the box he struck it the blazing head flew off upon the cream-colored thigh of his palm beach suit his naturally placid temper undermined by thirty years of newspaper work and two years of prohibition flamed up also with a loud scream of rage and a curse against sweden he leapt to his feet and shook the glowing cinder from his person Facing him, he found a stranger who had entered the room quietly and unobserved. This was a huge man, clad in a sober uniform of gray cloth, with silver buttons and silver braid. A Sam Brown belt of wide blue leather marched across his extensive diagonal in a gentle curve. The band of his visored military cap showed the initials C.P.H. in silver embroidery. His face, broad and clean-shaven, shone with a luster which was partly warmth and partly simple friendliness. Save for a certain humility of bearing, he might have been taken for the liveried doorman of a moving-picture theatre or exclusive millinery shop. In one hand he carried a very large black leather suitcase. "'Is this Mr. Bleak?' he asked politely. "'Yes,' said the editor, in surprise. His secret surmise was that someone had died and left him a legacy which would enable him to retire from newspaper work. This is the unacknowledged dream that haunts many journalists. Mr. Bleak was wondering whether this was the way in which legacies were announced. The man in the gray uniform set the bag down with great care on the large flat desk. He drew out a key and unlocked it. Before opening it, he looked round the room. The city editor and three reporters were watching curiously. A shy gaiety twinkled in his clear blue eyes. "'Mr. Bleak,' he said, "'you and these other gentlemen present are men of discretion?' Bleak made a gesture of reassurance. The other leaned over the suitcase and lifted the lid. The bag was divided into several compartments. In one, the startled editor beheld a nest of tall glasses— and another a number of interesting flasks lying in a porcelain container among chipped ice in the lid was an array of straws napkins a flat tray labelled cloves and a bunch of what looked uncommonly like mint leaves mr bleak did not speak but his pulse was disorderly 
the man in grey drew out five tumblers and placed them on the desk rapidly several bottles caught the light there was a gesture of pouring a clink of ice and beneath the spellbound gaze of the watchers the glasses fumed and bubbled with a volatile potion a glass mixing rod tinkled in the thin crystal shells and the man of mystery deftly thrust a clump of foliage into each a well-known fragrance exhaled upon the tobacco-thickened air shades of the grail cried bleak mint julep the visitor bowed and pushed the glasses forward with the compliments of the corporation he said the city editor sprang to his feet sagely cynical he suspected a ruse it's a plant he exclaimed don't touch it it's a trick on the part of the department of justice trying to get us into trouble bleak gazed angrily at the stranger if this was indeed a federal stratagem what an intolerably cruel one in front of him the glasses sparkled alluringly a delicate mist gathered on their ice-chilled curves a pungent sweetness wavered in his nostrils see here he blurted in shrill excitement are you a damned government agent if so take your poison and get out the tall stranger in his impressive uniform stood erect and unabashed with affectionate care he gave the tumblers a final musical stir o oh, ye of little faith he said calmly the sadness of the misunderstood idealist grieved his features have you forgotten the miracle of cana from his pocket he took a card and laid it on the desk bleak seized it it said the corporation for the perpetuation of happiness one three one six caraway street virgil quimbleton associate director he stared at the pasteboard stupefied and handed it to the city editor meanwhile the three reporters had drawn near light-hearted and irresponsible souls unoppressed by the embittered suspicion of their superiors they nosed the floating aroma with candid hilarity the breath of eden said one it's a warm evening remarked another with seeming irrelevance the face of virgil quimbleton a man in grey relaxed again at these marks of honest appreciation he waved an encouraging arm over the crystals with the compliments of the corporation he repeated bleak and the city editor looked again at the card and at each other they scanned the face of their mysterious benefactor bleak's hand went out to the nearest glass he raised it to his lips an almost forgotten formula recurred to him down the rat hole he cried and tilted his arm the others followed suit and the associate director watched them with a glow of perfect altruism the glasses were still in the air when the cartoonist emerged from his room holy cat he cried in amazement what's going on he seized one of the empty vessels and sniffed it treason he exclaimed who's been robbing the mint maybe you can have one too said bleak and turned to where quimbleton had been standing but the mysterious visitor had left the room you're too late bill said the city editor genially there was a kind of messiah here but he's gone tough luck say boss suggested one of the reporters there's a story in this may i interview that guy bleak picked up the card and put it in his pocket a heavenly warmth pervaded his mental fabric a story he said forget it this is no story it's a legend of the dear dead past i'll cover this assignment myself he borrowed a match and lit his pipe then he put on his coat and hat and left the office it was remarked by faithful readers of the balloon that the next day's cartoon was one of the least successful in the history of that brilliant newspaper End of chapter 1